Thank you for tuning in to this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And you may be seated, and if you um, were able to check your child into elementary class, they can leave now and go to the foundry. Uh, getting ready to have Children's Church over there. Amen? Amen for Children's Church? Yay! Two or three people happy about that. Well, if it happens to be the first time this at our campus here in Belmont, you are a special guest. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, I, I pray that you've felt the presence of the Lord here. Does anybody felt his presence here this morning? Amen. And of course, happy Father's Day to all of our fathers in the house. I am uh, privileged to have had a great father um, and, and, and have fond memories of him and being his son. And I pray that you celebrate that today. And maybe that's not your story. Maybe your story's not as happy or not as joyful, but we can celebrate today because we have the best Father Amen. available to us, and that is God our Father. And so, happy Father's Day to all our fathers out there, and uh, for those mothers who weren't here at Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day to you. We'll just get that all done at one time. Amen? Warriors is what we're talking about today, and I want to direct my comments to our fathers and the men that are in the house and those that are watching online today, but I don't want to leave you women out. I don't want you to tune me out and assume that because it's Father's Day and the traditional thing would be to come to church and hear a Father's Day message, I don't want you to feel like you don't need to pay attention because you do need to pay attention. I want to give you some very important information. As a matter of fact, it's actually a bad thing when you don't have all the information. Amen? There was a, a lady who was at her kitchen sink and she was washing her dishes and she looked out in her yard and she saw that her, her German shepherd had a rabbit in its mouth. And she thought, oh my goodness, that's the neighbor's rabbit. And she went outside and proceeded to take a stick and beat that German shepherd until he released that rabbit. At that point, she thought, what am I going to do about this? I know what I'll do. She went and got a handle to a broom and she picked that rabbit up, lifeless in its little body, and she took it on into the house. When she got it in the house, she thought, I've got to make this look better than what it looks right now. The rabbit was dirty. The dog had drug it through the dirt and the mud, and the slobber off the bottom of his chin had made that mud cake up, and she thought, I know what I'll do. I'll wash it. So she put that rabbit with that pole in the bathtub on one side, and she took the sprayer off, and she cleaned the side of the rabbit. And she thought, well, that looks better than what it did look, so let me do the other side. And she flipped that rabbit over, and she cleaned the other side, and she thought, okay, we're getting there. We're going to get somewhere. She thought, how am I going to get this rabbit to look like what happened didn't happen? And so she got her blow dryer. And she blew that rabbit's fur on one side until he puffed up, and then she flipped it over and blew dry the other side of that rabbit and made it look like he was still had some life in him. And then she proceeded to wait until she saw that her neighbor was not paying attention, and she took that rabbit and she slipped out into the backyard and put it back in its cage, propped him up right in the corner. She went back in the house. She waited. It was about an hour later. She heard a blood-curdling scream from the neighbor, and she thought, oh boy, here we go. And she went out the back door, pretending that she had no idea what was going on, and said, what's wrong? And the neighbor shrieked and said, our rabbit died two weeks ago, and he's back! <laughs> it's good to have all the information. It's good to know what you're up against. Guys, this morning the message is directed at us, but it's always good to have all the information that you need. As I mention a few things, if it happens to apply to you in this place, I want you to raise your hand this morning. As a baby, you were placed in a basket made of bulrushes and sent floating down a river because you were born at a time when all the males had to be thrown into the river and killed. Anybody? You were found floating down the river by an enemy family, taken in and then raised in a house of that enemy as their own child. Once you became of age, you felt a compulsion to stand up for injustice that was happening and had killed a man and then subsequently fled into the wilderness. Any takers? You saw a bush that was burning, but it wasn't being consumed, and you heard an audible voice, the voice of God, talking through that bush. How about this one? 
You hate public speaking, but you've been directed to go to the highest ranking leader of an entire nation and make demands. How about this one? You've prophesied and witnessed the onslaught of terrible plagues that were administered by God. Have you led two million people on a march out of a foreign land after having animals, linens, metals, and wood dumped in your lap? Have you had a cloud lead you by day and a pillar of fire by night? Have you witnessed a large body of water stand at attention and allow the passing of those two million people that you were leading right through the middle on dry ground and then fall and consume the enemy that was coming in behind you? The events that I just described to you briefly are a snapshot of the life of a man by the name of Moses. And when Moses reached the point in his life that he and his sister had witnessed all of these things of God, he sang a song. And the song that him and his sister sang began with important words that give us a piece of information that we so desperately need. This verse comes in Exodus chapter 15, and it's verse 3, and it simply says this, The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. I want to repeat that for you. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. That gives us a piece of information, guys. That, that gives us a piece of the puzzle that maybe we had considered before, but we need to consider again today in a different level. The Lord is a warrior. How many of you are glad that the Lord is a warrior? Amen? Because there's mighty battles that need to be fought, and there's mighty enemies that we're to come against, and we need a warrior to fight those battles. Moses had witnessed leadership during his life, protection, provision, supernatural power, compassion, inspiration, and might all over the course of his lifetime. And all of those attributes that he had experienced and observed allowed him when he was in the throes of praise. How many of you ever been in the throes of praise? We were just moments ago, some of us. When he was in that moment, encapsulated in worship and praise, the words that he scribed in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for us in the book of Exodus said, the Lord is a warrior. Taking into consideration all of the things that he had seen and the things that he knew about his God. Now, men, pay special attention to this verse here. This is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It's the creation story, if you will, if I can take you back to that very quickly. And all of the things that we see around us have been created, the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, the trees and the plants and all of those things. And in chapter 1, verse 27 of Genesis, the very beginning of time, it says these words, so God created mankind in his own image. That's important for us men to understand that we are created in God's own image. Because of that, because we have established right here off the bat this morning, and as we start to learn about this God, this God of the Old Testament, and those of you that know me know I love the Old Testament. I love what it brings to us because it gives us this picture that once we have a hold of, we experience and understand as we move into the New Testament that all things come about. And so as we see this picture of God in the Old Testament, we see that this statement that he is a man of war, if you've got a King James Version, or a warrior, this attribute of God, and that we are created in his own image. What does that mean? It means you and I, my brothers have the blood and the DNA of a warrior running through our veins. I have a lot of things that I want to say, but I have prayed up this week and asked the Lord not to let me say things He does not want me to say. I will say this. I know some men that don't act like warriors. They don't act like men of war. But I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt this morning that they don't understand yet that they are made in the image of God and that part of the image of God is that he is a warrior. Will anybody say amen? Now, some of you just bowed up a little bit when I said you were a warrior. I saw that. I saw some chests. Some guys sat up a little steeper in their seats and they were like, yeah, that's right, baby. Look at that. I'm a warrior this morning. 
I want you to feel that, not so that you can boast about yourself, as Paul said in the New Testament, but so that we can boast on Him who we are made in the image of. A warrior. We've got the DNA and the blood of a warrior running in our veins. When that mentality kicks in and we understand our position as warriors in Christ, as made in the image of Christ, it makes us think a little differently. When I said the word warrior or you saw warrior pop up on the screen, you probably had some images that popped in your head. Yes? Maybe you've seen some television shows or read some history. Yes, history. Or maybe you've seen some movies and there's a warrior picture in your head and you say, yeah. Now, women, I know what picture came in your head. Y'all need to be praying right now. I'm talking to the men who who realize that there's a warrior thing going on. So it changes the way we feel about ourselves. And then I remembered, as I was thinking about this this week, this warrior mentality, this warrior DNA, that there was a man in the Bible by the name of Gideon. Anybody remember Gideon? Oh, yeah, Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Gideon is introduced to us in Judges chapter 6 at a time when Israel had been, in verse 1 of chapter 6, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I could stop right there and preach an entire message because I can relate to that today. Does anybody have anything that would help them relate to the fact that there was a nation who was doing evil in the eyes of the Lord? Oh, you should. That should ring a big old bell this morning because we're living in one. We're living in a nation and in a world that's doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. And when Israel, who was doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, did this for a period of time, God let their enemy, the Midianites, come in and take over for a while. If you need to review that, go back this week and read in Judges chapter 6. And so the Midianites, they were harassing the people of Israel day and night. They were coming in and taking over all of their space. And here's what the Israelites did. As you read through there, you're going to recognize and realize the Israelites, they bailed out. The Israelites in chapter 6 of Judges have gone into the mountains, the cliffs, and the caves to live and left the Midianites to have their land. That doesn't sound like a warrior mentality to me. That doesn't sound like the DNA of a warrior running through their veins, but they left. They abandoned what was rightfully theirs, and they left. Have you abandoned your rightful territory? And I'm not talking about a piece of land this morning. I'm talking about what the Lord has given you. I'm talking about what is rightfully yours in the kingdom of heaven. Have you abandoned that this morning? I pray that you have not. But these Israelites abandoned it and they went into the mountains and in the clefts, the the Bible says, and they're living there and the Midianites were harassing them. I can just picture the Midianites down there yelling obscenities up at the cliffs, telling them, hey, we've got your land, we've taken over your crops, you can't even feed your families. And the Bible says that there were so many Midianites, the enemy, that had come into the land that they were like locusts. They were every where swarming it says like locusts and they came in and they ravaged the land but then verse 6 of chapter 6 says that the Israelites as they often do cried out to the Lord does anybody remember the history of the Israel people of the Hebrews as they came out of Egypt as we talked about with Moses leading them through the Red Sea that as they wandered in the wilderness and in subsequent years they would cry out to the Lord and the Lord would do what he would send them an answer And then what would they do? They would turn their back on the Lord again. And then they would realize, we've messed up. We want to renew our covenant with you, God. And they would cry out to the Lord. Well, this is one of those times when the Israelites cried out to the Lord. And what does the Lord always do? I am here by myself this morning. He is faithful and He always sends help. Well, we could just stop right there this morning and we could leave here and we could have a bolstered faith in the fact that we know that as He helped the children of Israel, every time they cried out for help, He will help us. Amen? 
We can cry out for help. It doesn't matter. They had gone seven years doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Didn't say they did bad things. Didn't say they were just pushing their sister, right? It says they were doing evil things. And so are we at a place in our world right here on Father's Day 2020 where if we were to realize that we were doing the wrong thing, that we were doing evil as a nation, as a family, as a church, as a person, we could cry out to the Lord, would He send help? Yes. Absolutely He would because He is faithful always. They cried out to the Lord and He starts the process of redeeming them from their enemies. Do you realize there's always a redemption story? Have y'all read the Old Testament? There's stories in there of how people have failed God miserably and when they cry out for help, He starts the process of redemption in their life and in their land. Somebody ought to be saying, praise the Lord this morning for that. Because we are in that situation where we find ourselves in desperate need and we find out that there is evil that has gone on and we cry out to the Lord and He starts the process of redemption. All of the Old Testament accounts are recorded for us for that very reason, to lead us to the final redemption story. The final redemption story, the one that comes in and covers it all, and that is our Savior, the Lord and Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross, His bones broken and His blood pouring down. Redemption, that's the process that the Old Testament points us to. And that redemption, my brothers and my sisters this morning, is for all mankind. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. I know that's not a Bible verse, but it's a great Bible song. That doesn't sound like anybody's left out to me. As a matter of fact, in that redemption process, it sounds to me like all life matters. Amen? It sounds to me like when He looks at people, He sees their heart, not their age, their gender, their color. So the redemption process starts, and if you're looking for salvation this morning or redemption from your sins, you can see that from your past or for your present, there's only one answer, and the name is Jesus. If you're looking for redemption or forgiveness of your sins from anywhere else, you're raking leaves in a hurricane. It's not going to happen. So the Midianites are running scared And they've abandoned, I'm sorry, the Israelites are running scared, and they've abandoned their land. They've given it up. They've left what was rightfully theirs, and they're in the hills. And we find this boy named Gideon. And what is Gideon doing? He's living up in the hills with all the other scaredy cats. And an angel of the Lord comes and sits down under a tree where Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. That's what Gideon is doing. And the, and, the, and the Bible says that Gideon, in verse 12, is threshing wheat in a wine press, and the angel of the Lord comes and sits down under a tree and says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Isn't that what he said? He tells Gideon he is a mighty warrior. That sounds to me like Gideon is made in the image of God. And if Gideon is made in the image of God and he is a mighty warrior and he's been declared so as the angel of the Lord has just declared to Gideon, then wouldn't that apply to you and to me? Absolutely. Mighty warrior. And I love Gideon's response. Pardon me? That's what Gideon says. Hey, Gideon, the Lord is with you and you are a mighty warrior. I'm sorry? Come again one more time on that. You know, that's how I feel nowadays when you go to the bank or Lowe's or wherever and there's this plastic shield up. I don't know if those people can hear me, but they're back there mumbling the total of my whatever I'm buying. And, I'm, you know, and they say, well, it's what I'm saying. And I say, I'm sorry. Pardon me. And have you noticed that now we're all stepping to the side? Plastic shield. I'm sorry? What's that? Yeah, no problem. Here you go. He says, pardon me, excuse me, say again. Are you talking to me? Have you ever asked yourself this question? I I did this week. You know, some of 
some of my analyzation of Scripture kind of goes too far and I get caught up. But what is Gideon doing threshing wheat in a wine press? Shouldn't you be threshing wheat on a threshing floor and pressing grapes in a wine press? Some of you just went, man, I never saw that. Why is he threshing wheat in a wine press? This is important, guys. Check this out. Gideon. And I believe what subsequently led to the angel of the Lord coming down and speaking to Gideon and telling him that he was a warrior, a mighty warrior, is the fact that Gideon couldn't take it anymore. This had been going on too long. He had seen his people driven out of their land and into the caves and the cliffs of the mountains and had given up what was rightfully theirs. He had seen his people, his own family, his friends, starving to death. By the way, the process of threshing wheat is to separate that which you can eat by that which you cannot. And he said, I got to do something about this. I need all the men in the house to say, do something. And I need all the women to say, amen. He said, I got to do something about this. I can't get down to the threshing floor because the Midianites are down there doing googly eyes and sticking their tongue out at me and they're going to kill me if I go down there. But I've got a wine press right here and I've got a little bit of wheat right here and my family's got to eat and I've got to get off my duff and I got to do something. So I'm going to take that wheat and I'm going to go into that wine press and I'm going to thresh it and I'm going to make out of it something to do something and feed my family with. And I believe because of the confidence and the faith and the fact that Gideon would act on something when no one else would, God looked down and saw Gideon and said, that's my boy. That's my boy right there. I can do work through this guy because instead of having excuses and deciding that, oh, it's too hard in society. Oh, we've got to wear rubber gloves and masks. Oh, there's a shield in front of me and I can't get through it. Gideon said, no, sir. Not another day is going to go by and I'm going to sit and do nothing. And he took that wheat and he went into that wine press and he threshed that wine press. You know what? That's a good message right there. Pastor Joseph, write that down. Don't let the enemy have control of your livelihood. I just thought of that. Some of us men have relinquished the control. We have relinquished our livelihood because we've convinced ourselves and we've let the enemy lie to us. It's just too hard. We don't have what we need. I can't thresh wheat without a threshing floor. But Gideon said... Not today. Today I'm going to take what I have in my left hand, I'm going to take what I have in my right hand, and I'm going to make it work. Somebody in the house say, make it work. So these people can't even feed their families the way they always have. Hmm. A lot of talk about getting back to normal these days, isn't it? Oh, I wish I could go back and just do it the way I used to do it. I wish we could get back to normal and I could do this the way I always have. Gideon said, I can't thresh wheat the way I've always threshed wheat. I'm going to have to find a different way, but I can't give up. Because the people were doing eyes in the evil of the Lord. But Gideon sees that he can do something about it. And I believe, like I said, that the Lord sees Gideon and says... That's my guy. I can work through him. Gideon had warrior DNA running through his blood. Not only is Gideon made in the image of God, he's got that warrior DNA, but Gideon is doing something with what he's got. He threshes wheat. He shows the qualities of a warrior It shows the qualities of being made in the image of God because didn't God take what was nothing and make something of it? Yes, He did. Doesn't God come through when there seems to be no way? Yes, He does. And the Lord saw that and said, boom. He's got warrior spirit. And then I found in Psalms 144, some of you have tried to read through Psalms before and you didn't quite make it to the 144th chapter. 
But I made it there this week, and I saw where David, and I'm talking about a man named King David, was writing to the Lord himself, was giving admonition to the Lord and said these words, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. What a beautiful verse that is. Because what David was saying and what we would be saying if we would pray that, if we would read that and understand that verse today, is that God is interested in training us. Oh, he's down into the minutia, the details. He doesn't just say, hey, good luck with that. No, sir. If you start a new job and you go into a new job, hopefully it's a great company, and what they will do is train you for your job. They won't just throw you out there and expect you to have all the answers, right? Some of you are like, no, I had that job. They did do exactly that. I'm talking about the ideal situation here. God doesn't just throw us out there, men. Mighty men of valor, mighty warriors, and say, good luck. He trains us. He trains our hands for war. And he trains our fingers for battle. All the way down to this intricate little digits that we've got on the end of our hands. He says, I'm going to train you for what you need to be trained for. I love the fact that in writing that, David is saying, There's personal involvement by that big guy that we call God in our personal lives. Personal involvement. David was astounded by it. How amazing are you, Lord, David was saying. So what has he trained us for, men? Some of you might be saying, I get all that, I understand that. Gideon, yeah, great for Gideon. Yeah, yeah, great for Moses. Great for King David. But what about me? What has he trained us for? Man, I'm here today to remind you that you are made in the image of a warrior. You are made in the image of God. You have warrior DNA and warrior blood running through your veins. You're a mighty warrior as Gideon was, and the Lord has trained you for war and your fingers for battle. You are ready. You are bolstered at this point. Some of you are probably thinking, Well, I actually can't wait for this service to be over because I'm going to go hunt something down and kill it. Some of you are already looking for a fight. You're thinking, you're right. I am a warrior. I'm about to go fight. As a matter of fact, I feel like fighting right now. I'd, I'd like to fight some of you right now. I feel that same thing inside. And so you're bolstered and you're ready. But sometimes you just don't have all the information and you don't know what it is you're ready for. What am I ready? What am I prepared for to fight. I need to show you this morning before we leave here where the fight is. And I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 7 if you've got your Bibles. It's a familiar passage because we've preached it and taught it. This is where Paul is saying, I do all the things that I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I do want to do. Do you know what I'm talking about? And he keeps going and he says in verse 23, but I see another law That's at work in me. Everybody say, in me. Man or woman, there's a law at work in you. And it's waging war. It's waging war against the law of what? This thing right here. Everybody say, my mind. If we were in kids' church, I'd have you point to it. She did it. Thank you very much. It's waging war up here. This is where the battle is. Amen? Amen? It's waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Now, somebody in the house is going to say, hold on a second, pastor. I thought that when I got saved and gave my life to Christ, I didn't have that in me anymore. Well, that ain't true. I'm telling you that is covered by the blood of Jesus when you ask forgiveness and give repentance. But the sinful nature is still inside you. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Romans. In chapter 7, there's a a, a sin at work within me and it keeps me prisoner. What is being kept prisoner? Where am I being kept locked up? In my mind. Amen? So we are looking for the fight everywhere, but sometimes we're not directing our battle cry 
and our warrior mentality to the right places. It's in our mind, making me a prisoner. It's keeping me locked up. I can't get away from it. it the war is in our minds. That's why the Bible tells us to be renewed in our minds. There's a process to redemption, and it's in the battle of the mind. The, the mind has to be processed. Now, let me make this clear, because I don't want anybody sending me an email this week and misquoting what I said. I did not tell you to go out and think positively, and everything's going to be okay. I do not believe that any more than I believe that I am going to grow hair. It's not about me deciding and making up my mind, and I've got the power within me to be a better person. As a matter of fact, I would subscribe to you this morning. You don't have it with the inside of you, and that's why you need Jesus. We couldn't do it without Him. Again, read the Old Testament. They couldn't do it on their own. They had to have a redeeming Savior to come and do it. So rather than that train of thought, we see that the renewing of our mind would involve understanding where the war is and preparing for battle men. Now, we would rather make it something tangible to fight, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we rather it be something tangible, something we could go put our hands on? Hey, I got an idea. Let's make it the political system. Right? Let's go fight some of those people. If you were here two weeks ago, the air quotes on those people. You get it, right? Let's go make it their fault. I tell you right now, the political system in our country and in our world is corrupt. It has a sinful nature. It will never be right. The only time that the government that you will be able to depend on will be in place is when Jesus Christ comes, sets His feet on the Mount of Olives, and sets up a kingdom that will last forever. You can put your confidence in that. But if you're looking to the fight to be in the political system, you're wrong. Let's make this our fight. Let's make our differences our fight. Can we do that? Well, isn't it easy to fight somebody that isn't like you? So that makes it more interesting and that makes it more fun. So let's make it something tangible. Let's make it about gender. Let's make it about race. Let's make it about ethnic background. Let's make it about equality. I'm here to tell you this morning that that is not where the fight is. Those things for the follower of Christ are rendered useless and outdated. Read Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 that says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed, your, clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So when we, as followers of Christ, look out and see the differences in our brothers and sisters and say, yeah, that's where the fight is, we are dead wrong. The fight is a sin fight. It's in the sinful nature of the society that we live in. They want you to pull your eyes off of Jesus and say, that guy's not like me. He's not right. But Jesus said, there is no difference between my brother and my sister and me. We are all one because we are in Christ Jesus. That's what I stand on. Maybe we look for the fight to be about a virus. Maybe that's where the fight is. And that tiny little molecular thing that we'd have to put under a microscope to see, but yet we got the boxing gloves on and we're like, that's where the fight's at, I'm going to fight it. This virus has the church so distracted that we don't even know if it's, if it's, if it's right to come together. We don't know if, it, if we can come together and sit beside one another. We don't know if we can come together and, and, and pray for one another. We, we don't know what to do. We say that must be where the fight is because that's a big deal. That's a global pandemic. But my God, I'm here to tell you this morning is so powerful that a tiny microscopic virus doesn't stand a chance in His presence. As a matter of fact, on Friday night when we were here and cleaned the building and sprayed Lysol all over the chairs and the tables that you're sitting at, I was praying as we were spraying. That's a message right there. Write that down too. Wow, I'm on it this morning. We were praying as we were spraying. God, this virus has no place in your presence. Don't let it touch one person. Protect all these families. Oh God, bring healing to our nation. It can't stand up against our God. Those things are not the fight. Ephesians 6 and verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the principalities and authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's where the fight is. It's up here, and it's out there. It's stuff we can't see. That's why when you go to a church and they won't talk about the supernatural power of Jesus Christ, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit that's supposed to be residing inside of us, they are dead wrong because you can't fight this thing in the physical. This thing is being fought in the spiritual realm. And you've got to have the Holy Spirit inside you to even see it. The weapons that we fight with are not material weapons. They are spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 should be on the screen. It says, For though we walk in flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. This stuff right here. We live in the flesh, in this world with the flesh, but this isn't where the battle is. We don't war with this stuff. He continues and says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What does that mean? Fleshly, temporary, carnal. He's given us a warning and he's saying, if you're fighting the battle like that, forget it. It's not where the battle is. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now we're getting into some language that I like. As a warrior, you ought to say, yeah, I'm looking for some strongholds. I'm fixing to pull them babies down. Amen? Amen. Have you ever been there, guys? Or did you see the stronghold and said, oh, it looks pretty big there. Woo, she's a big one. No, sir. The Moses, the Gideon, the warrior DNA says, I see you, stronghold. I see those thoughts in my mind that shouldn't be there. I see the proclivity inside of me for sin. I see that my fleshly desire is going to grind me into the ground and I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my children. I'm going to lose my position. I'm going to lose my ministry because my testimony is going into the ground. I see you stronghold. And I'm going to pull you down. Is there anybody in the room, man or woman, that would stand up with me and say, I'm going to pull it down? Well, then do it. I'm going to pull it down. I didn't come to preach to myself today. I came to give you the word of the Lord. And he said, you have the power inside of you, if you see that stronghold, to pull it down. And then he says, he doesn't stop there because this is good stuff. Casting down. So I get to pull down some stuff and then I get to cast down some stuff. I'm going to grab it like this right here and I'm going to throw it to the floor. You ever been to the gym and they handed you one of those balls that weighs like 100 pounds and when the lady hands it to you, she looks like she's carrying like something five pounds. But when, when you get it, you're like, oh my goodness. Hey now. And she says, just raise it over your head and cast it down as hard as you can and that'll build you up inside. And you're thinking, I couldn't pick this thing up if it was my life dependent on it. But that's what we got to do. We got to see that thing in life that we've got to cast down. We got to pull it. You can sit down if you want. And we got to cast it down. That's warrior talk right there. That's that's DNA of a of a man of God right there that says, "I'm not going to play with it." Am I preaching anything good here? I'm not going to play with it. I say, "Oh, okay. Yeah, I can juggle this into the rest of my life." Guys, that's what we do. I can, I can handle this on my own. I'm going to juggle this into the rest of my life. But with my ministry and with my lovely family and with all the other things that everybody can see, I'll be able to handle this. It won't get me. Paul says, don't be so... Oh God, don't let me say it. Stupid. To think that you can let it be there. You've got to cast it down. What am I casting down? Arguments. Arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's pretty strong. You better go home and start putting some things on a list and decide, is this an argument against the knowledge of God? Does this thing in my life that I've allowed to be here exalt itself against the knowledge of God? You could probably look in your checkbook. You could probably look at your calendar and see where you're spending your time and see if there's something in there 
that exalts itself and, and has an argument against the knowledge of God. And when you see it, when you find it, don't play patty cakes. Warriors don't play patty cakes. I had two sisters and they was always in the back seat that did some kind of a patty cake thing going on back there. Well, even as a small boy, I must have been upset about patty caking because I would tell on them and say, they're back here playing patty cakes. Make them stop. Because something inside this warrior right here said, I ain't playing patty cakes. I'm fixing to cast my sisters down. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, just, I'm fixing to cast down arguments and every high thing that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And then after all of that, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Oh, guys, if you're looking for something tangible to bring into the obedience of Christ, you go out there in the world and you're looking for the political thing that you can drag in, the, the racial, the gender thing that you can drag in and make it some, about something out there that's something tangible. If you're looking to see if you can make it about the virus, you're wrong. It's your thoughts that are the problem that you need to get under control. And when you bring your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ, He will change your life. I could be very specific, men, about one particular area that we have a proclivity for and that you need to bring into captivity and into the obedience of Christ. Do you not think that your enemy who seeks to destroy you is working 365 to make that happen? He is. Don't be a fool. Don't think he takes time off. Your enemy is after you. He does not take time off. You have to bring every thought. And so we're pulling and we're casting and we're bringing. And those are the weapons that we are using. Not fleshly weapons, but weapons of the Spirit. And this is your weapon. Oh, sharper than any two-edged sword and able to divide even to the marrow. This is. So you want to know what your weapons are? It's your Word. And you want to know where the weapon plays? In the spirit realm and in your mind. Men, that's what we're dealing with today. The Bible is our weapon. And the words that are contained within it are Jesus Himself. We're reminded that the Word became flesh and dwelt among them. This is Jesus. This is what He says to you. You say, well, I've never heard from the Lord. Have you read it? If you haven't, maybe that's why you haven't heard from the Lord. He doesn't always talk audibly through a, 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 a brush that's burning that's not being consumed. Moses was a lucky guy. I would love for the Lord to speak something audibly to me like that, but it doesn't happen to the majority of us but He does speak to me daily through this book. And the more I read this book, the more I understand who He is and how He operates and that He is a warrior. So what's the practical application for all of this? How, how am I going to do it? I hear what you're saying, Pastor. I hear what you said about Gideon. I hear what you say about Moses. But what about me? How do I do this? How do I apply this? Number one, it starts right here, repentance. Yeah, that's where it starts, guys. Repentance. You must be born again. There is no other way to the Father. There is no other way to salvation. You must be born again. And that starts with you seeing the need in your own life that you are a sinner and you need a Savior. And then you repent of your sins. You say to God the Father, I have sinned, but I believe your Son Jesus came and died and gave His life so that I don't have to bear the weight of that sin. I repent of it today. And what happens when that happens? God smiles, Jesus smiles, and He sends the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you. And all of a sudden, you've got warrior DNA running through your bones. Repentance. Number two, confession. It's always good to tell somebody. 
Now, I didn't mean that you got to go make a post on Facebook. I don't want to know your dirty business, and I don't want everybody else to know. I want you to find a brother in Christ. Men, it has to be another man. Can I be more clear about that? You can't go tell it to some woman somewhere. It's got to be another faith following warrior in Christ and you sit down with them after building a relationship of trust and you say, I need to tell you my sins. I need to tell you what I struggle with. I need you to help me. So confession is good for the soul. Number three, you have to allow accountability. Oh, I knew he was going to go there at some point. That's right, you have to allow accountability. Somebody has to know you. Somebody has to know that when you didn't show up on time where you could be, where you used to be, and they'll call you out. Oh, I've got several brothers that I stay accountable to, and if I don't do what I say I'm going to do and I don't show up where I say I'm going to show up, they call me out on it. And sometimes they'll hear me say things and they'll pull me to the side and call me out. I want that. I invite that into my life. It's called accountability, guys. And you need some because you are a warrior in Christ, but you are still susceptible to your sinful nature. It's at war within you. Number four, you got to put on the full armor of God every day and die to self. You've got a prayer life, guys, men, fathers. You got a prayer life? I hope you do. If you don't, you better get one because the battle is getting stronger and the war is getting wider. And if you don't have a prayer life where you spend some time with the Heavenly Father every day and in His Word and ask Him for help and strength, you need one. You have to have that in order for you to put on that full armor of God that we read about in the New Testament and go out into the world. Why in the world would we leave our homes and go out knowing that the battle is raging and not put on our armor? Don't do it. Number five, read, pray, repeat. Read, pray, repeat. Guys, that's the recipe for success with the warrior mentality. And number six, pull down strongholds, cast out arguments, and bring your thoughts into captivity. That's the deal. That's the process. That's how it gets to the point where you can stand in a church service or in your bedroom all by yourself when nobody else is looking and look up into heaven and say, my God, I worship You. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? As normal, I have preached way too long. It's pretty simple, guys. The battle is in our minds. The battle is in the supernatural. And we're wasting our time trying to fight it with our flesh. So on this Father's Day, 2020, in the midst of a global pandemic and chaos in the streets, and an enemy who has succeeded in a lot of ways to blind us, I pray this morning that there's no more dead rabbits and that you've got the full picture. And so I'm asking simply this. We'll start with fathers and men. Is there a man in the house that would be warrior enough this morning to raise a hand and say, Pastor, as we pray and finish our service today, don't forget about me. Because I know I'm a warrior, but my eyes have been opened this morning to where the battle really is. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Guys, we shouldn't be timid about this. When we recognize where the battle's at, we ought to run to it. Maybe you're here in the house today and honestly taking a look at yourself and understanding who you are. You say, you know, I've never even started with repentance. I've skipped down the process and I'm over here trying to 
trying to do uh, step number four, but I've never repented to God my sins and asked Him to, to forgive me and, and accepted the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins. Maybe you need to start back with step number one. I want to invite you. Be a warrior today. Stand up from where you are. This altar is open, pandemic or not. You come down here and you start talking to God about it. And I guarantee you that there's a band of brothers who will surround you and help you find your way into the kingdom today. How about the ladies in the house? You're not left out of this because your minds are just as susceptible as ours to all of the battles that are going on. And your battle is in the supernatural just like ours is. You see things differently. You, you, you act out things differently. But you and your battle is real this morning. Is there a lady in the house that would say, Pastor, don't forget about me as we close this time in prayer? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's simply this. The altar's open. I'm calling an altar call right now. If you need to be here and you need to do business with God, you need to do battle this morning. I'm here to help you do battle. I would love to pray with you. I would love to agree with you. I would love to assist you in finding the answer to the battles of your mind this morning. Come on. Can't wait much longer. The clock's ticking. If that's you, just come on. Amen. My expectation would be that we wouldn't play. We're not playing patty cake. Like I said, we're doing battle down here. And so, what I think I'm going to hear and what I hope I'm going to hear are some people crying out to God like the children of Israel did when they realized they were not in the right place. Because God is not in the business of playing games. He's in the business of redeeming people. Amen. Saving people. So if you're out there, I just need you to start praying. You just need to start praying whatever the Spirit's telling you to pray right now. If He tells you to get up and come, come pray with somebody, you need to do it. We need to follow the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in these next few moments. We're not playing. The battle is real. Don't wait. Don't leave here today and say, I should have. Leave here today and say, I did. Yes. Break every stronghold, Holy Spirit, in this place. You have no idea what I feel inside me right now. I wish you could. I, I hope you do. Because there's an urgency and a passion to see people free. 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 Maybe it's an addiction with you. And you have wrestled against that longer than you can remember. Would you be willing to be a warrior today and walk down here and talk to God about it one more time? And let a brother or a sister pray with you and believe with you and claim victory today with you. Don't hesitate. Move. They're going to sing very softly for just a moment and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to lead us, but I don't want to be the only one praying. Can we just do a chorus of something? And give people time, give the Holy Spirit time to move. Be praying.
Some of you may not have been in a church service like this before. And maybe you got up this morning and came to church and you didn't think it was going to be quite like this. It's a little tense, isn't it? Is it a little tense? Is that just me? It's because there's a battle. And it's going on in your mind and my mind right now saying, it's probably time to dismiss and go home. That's exactly what the enemy wants. Let's go home. We had a good service. He's clapping. He's already at the door. Heavenly Father, I stand today with my brothers and my sisters in Christ Jesus. And we proclaim that we are warriors of the cross of Jesus Christ. We also proclaim today, Father God, that we have failed you. We sinned. We've omitted, and in doing so, we've sinned against you because we did not stand. We've acted out of anger, out of ignorance, and in doing so, we have sinned. We have allowed addiction and sin to remain in our lives. And we confess that sin to you right now. I stand here as a pastor of this church, and I bring this church to you in repentance. Forgive us, O oh God, because we have sinned. We have failed you. And I pray for each person who is wrestling right now. Oh, I can feel it. The wrestling is happening in their mind and in their spirit right now, and they're coming up with all kinds of reasons why this wasn't for them. This wasn't directed at them. I wasn't speaking on your behalf to them. But God, I pray that it would overcome them in such a powerful way that they would understand before they leave this place today, you were talking to them. God, forgive us for hating our brothers and sisters because they're different than we are. Forgive us, God, for turning on the news and putting more effort and time into the political system, the corrupt political system of this world than we have put into you this week. God, forgive us for watching the statistics of a microscopic virus more then we watched for your hand of guidance and provision in our life this week. Forgive us. And now we celebrate in you the freedom that you have given us, the forgiveness that you have given us to be able to stand in this place today Worship who you are. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the same today as you were then. You have not changed. You provided for them. You made a way for them. And you will make a way for us today. So God, for the brokenhearted, the very person you sent your son for, the brokenhearted, the lonely, the, the poor in spirit, God, I pray for them today. That as you call them with your gentle Holy Spirit, that they would respond, that they would find true freedom in who you are. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. While you're still listening, before we sing this last song and you leave here, we are calling for a church wide prayer meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 right here in this room. Why? Because we believe that that's what the church of Jesus Christ should be doing. And I wouldn't be surprised tomorrow night at 6.30 if there aren't some strongholds pulled down. If there aren't some imaginations and some thoughts that come against the knowledge of Christ that are cast out. And if we don't bond together in a unity in prayer, 
that grabs the attention of Father God and says, that's my boy. That's my girl right there. I can do something with them. Would you sing? And then we'll be dismissed. Thank you for tuning into this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.